Good evening and welcome to eConversations. I'm your host, Dan Sutter, with the Johnson Center for Political Economy here at Troy University. The Federal Reserve System has been in the news recently with uh, President Obama announcing the selection of Janet Yellen as his choice for the, to be the new chairperson of the Federal Reserve. Uh, Janet Yellen would be replacing uh, Ben Bernanke, who's been the chairperson of the Fed during the 2008 financial uh, crisis and the ensuing recession since then. Uh, but the Federal Reserve has drawn its uh, fair share of, of criticism for its performance in, in the uh, housing bubble leading up to the, the financial crisis, as well as its performance since uh, 2008. And it's called, led to some calls for a some type of uh, fundamental reform of the of Federal Reserve System. To discuss this topic here this evening, I have two of my colleagues. Uh, first, uh, Dan Smith from the Johnson Center here at Troy University, and then uh, Dr. Robert Earl Stewart from the, the Sorrell College of Business, where he's a uh, finance professor and now, I guess, a, a, dis a distinguished lecturer in finance. Thank you and welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. So. Um, as we mentioned, uh, Janet Yellen is going to be replacing Ben Bernanke, who's had a, a, a difficult run as <coughs> Fed chairperson. But uh, before we get started and talk about how the Federal Reserve might be reformed, it's probably a good idea to talk a little bit about what it, how it's currently structured and uh, what its current functions are. So, um, Dan, if you could tell us a little bit about the uh, current structure of the, the Federal Reserve and, and uh, its history as well. Yeah, absolutely. The Federal Reserve, the primary decision-making body is the Board of Governors, and that has seven members on the committee. And those uh, uh, members are appointed by the President for 14-year terms, and it's staggered to come up every two years. However, due to retirements, oftentimes the President can uh, appoint more than just the, the number that would normally come up. In fact, President Obama has been able to appoint or reappoint all seven members of the Board of Governors. And in addition to appointing those members, the president will also choose uh, the chairman of the Federal Reserve, the vice chairman of the Federal Reserve, and since 2010, also vice chairman of supervision of the Federal Reserve. And those seven members called the, called the governors of the board uh, are the main decision-making body for the Federal Reserve. And then in combination with five other members who are uh, federal, uh, the presidents of the Federal Reserve banks, they create the, the Federal Open Market Committee and they jointly make the decisions and have the discussions on the actions that are gonna be undertaken uh, by the Federal Reserve. And these are the, <coughs> the Federal Reserve banks themselves, so they're located throughout the country. Yep, yep. At, at the beginning of the Federal Reserve, there was a huge political discussion on where these banks should be located, and they did their best at the time to geographically disperse the banks and create different industrial and class uh, divisions, so no one part of the country mm -hmm. was overrepresented. Uh, there's some conflict and trouble in actually accomplishing that, but these were the historical districts made. So, Robert Earl, then, is, is the Federal Reserve actually a run by the, the banks or is it a, a, a arm of the, the federal government or how exactly is it set is it is it ownership set up? Well this this has been a criticism of the Federal Reserve for years and that it's operated mainly for the banks and the banks profit heavily from it. And many say it's the large banks that control it. But you've got two sides of that argument. One, the Board of Governors is appointed by the president. They're supposed to be an independent organization. Mm -hmm. And they're supposed to operate under the directives given to them by Congress, mm -hmm. which at the beginning in 1913 was to guard against inflation and provide an elastic currency. Since then, due to developments in the late 40s and the dual mandate of 1977, full employment and price stability has become also a charge to the Federal Reserve. You know, there's been a lot of criticism about how they've developed this policy, whether they've been effective in it or not. But the Federal Reserve is owned by private banks. They own stock in the Federal Reserve. It is not owned by the federal government. And I've always viewed it as a utility company for money. Just like Alabama Power or Florida Power, they're owned by private stockholders, but they're basically controlled and their policies are set by government elected or government, government appointed uh, persons. And so you've, you've got the private ownership, but the government policies set the dictates for the Federal Reserve. And what are the, the major uh, 
functions for the economy that the Federal Reserve System undertakes? I mean, why is it that the uh, chairperson of the Federal Reserve is, su is such an important job? Well, again, back to the mandates, the Federal Reserve really was created as a result of the failure of the Second Bank of the United States, and it was mainly a result of the 1907 panic that uh, resulted in currency being unavailable for the public, for businesses, and uh, this was the main reason why the Fed was created, because they wanted a bank that would always be able to serve the liquidity needs of the commercial banks in the country so there would not be a liquidity shortage for banks. There's a term that's been misused for years by media and by even Congress and other peoples when they refer to the Fed printing money. I'd like to clarify that for our viewers. The Fed does not print money the way the media makes it out like they do, they print currency, which is a part of our money supply, but is not the complete money mm -hmm. supply. And the way the Fed creates its money is not by printing dollar bills, but by computer keys, by debiting and crediting the accounts of the member banks of the system and open market operations that has been referred to. But as far as currency is concerned, the public determines how much currency is there simply by trading in their deposits and obtaining from the currency. And so it's the public determines. And when you see these newsreels on TV and in the background every time they talk about the money supply, these printing presses printing up money, that is very misleading to the public. It, it, it infers to the public that the Fed has just printed up and just doling it out there, and that is certainly not true. Uh, but the Federal Reserve is in, uh, in charge of the money supply. They are in, in charge of the money supply. Uh, and most people are not aware that the money supply consists of currency and demand deposits in the banks, right. according to one definition. Savings deposits, as the saying goes, is what M2 is, which is another definition of the money supply. And then there's a third one that I won't refer to as a complicated one uh, <laughs> called the MZ money supply. And, and we won't get into that now, but there's three definitions of money supply, the main one being de demand deposits and currency that's out there. And I might point out for our viewers that currency right now is about 1.1 trillion out in our economy. Demand deposits are about 900 billion, and the total money supply, as the Fed defines it, is about 7 trillion. Well, so this is a, uh, what the Federal Reserve is currently doing. Now, uh, what is it that's been leading the folks to, some folks to think that there needs to be a reform of the Federal Reserve? Is it not uh, performing its uh, functions of price stability and, and full employment well, or Dan? Well, leading up to the financial crisis from 2001 to 2006, the Federal Reserve deviated from its policy, the Taylor Rule. It followed a, a rule of printing, uh, of, of creating uh, a certain amount, uh, or keeping the interest rates at a certain level and they deviated from that rule in 2001 and they should have let the interest rates go up. And when they kept interest rates artificially low, that encouraged excessive investment and uh, excessive uh, consumption, um, which prevented the economy from, the, the economy from readjusting. Usually interest rates act as like a natural interest rate break. Whenever home builders are building too many homes, try taking out loans to build those homes, there's too many doing that, the interest rates are gonna go up. They're going to say, oh, interest rate is higher. I'm going to quit building as many homes. However, when the Federal Reserve artificially kept those interest rates low, those home builders said, hey, the interest rates are low. Let's con continue building. They saw that as a sign that uh, they should continue building. And, and that's why you got uh, so that buildup of too many homes being built was part of uh, the, the policy of the Federal Reserve, keeping those interest rates low. And then following the financial crisis, you've seen from 2008 to uh, the current time, you've seen uh, over tripling of the, the monetary base. Mm -hmm. And this has largely been due to the Federal Reserve accommodating uh, the, the debt issuance of the United, the United States Treasury. So when you mentioned the monetary base, that's different from the money supply, correct? Yes. And so that's, a, and that's an increase in the monetary base that hasn't yet shown up necessarily as an increase in the money supply. Yeah, absolutely. And, and some economists argue that this is due to the fact that banks are very uncertain right now. You have a lot of uh, new regulations with the ACA and other types of regulations. You're in a recession. People are uncertain about making long-term investments. However, when businesses start making those long-term investments, that money is going to be lent out that's going to enter the system and it could potentially create inflation. Right. So that's ultimately then the, the 
danger of the cost of the economy if, if there has been too much money supply creation is going to be inflation, correct? Yes. Right. Well, well, Robert Earl, do you uh, agree with this assessment of, of Fed performance? Well, the Fed can affect the money supply either directly or indirectly. Mm -hmm. As been mentioned, open market operations as conducted by the Open Market Committee, that's the Fed going into the market and buying government securities or as recently buying mortgage-backed securities for the first time in history here two or three years ago due to the financial crisis. And they can go into the market and buy securities directly and go around the banks and not have to go through the commercial banks to affect the money supply. The way they do this, they just issue a check to whomever they're buying the securities from. That party deposits the check in the commercial bank of their choice. That commercial bank sends the check back to the Fed and the Fed just hits a few computer keys to take care of the transaction. It may be surprising to many people that although commercial banks have reserve requirements and capital requirements, there are no such requirements for the Federal Reserve. I've often said that the Federal Reserve is the most powerful institution in the world, and that the Board of Governors is the most powerful body in the world, more powerful than the Supreme Court, because they, by their decisions, can control our pocketbooks and can control the money supply. Real quickly, the indirect way that the Fed can control the money supply is their effect on operations of banks through what's known as reserve requirements and discounting of banks of productive paper at the Fed, known as the discount process, and through what's known as the federal fund rate. The Fed can raise or lower the reserve requirements that banks are required to hold behind their deposits. A raise in the reserve requirement would lessen the money supply. A a uh, decrease in the reserve requirement would induce banks to lend more because they had to hold less reserve behind their deposits. Rate changes would influence the same thing. And recently, in the last eight, nine years, the Fed apparently has seen fit to bypass the banks and go straight to the money supply by the buying of securities. And as most of our listeners are probably aware, quantitative easing to the tune of so many billion dollars a month, $80 billion a month, or whatever the correct figure is, that the Fed is, in essence, creating in the money supply each and every month. The money supply, according to the Fed's balance sheet, the Fed's balance sheet has increased from $900 trillion to $3.7 trillion since the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. The Fed apparently has on a path of believing that increases in the money supply, keeping interest rate down is the best way to promote the economy. I happen to be a disbeliever in that. That is a socialistic viewpoint in saying that it will affect the entire economy. I think the Fed's problem has been that they've been trying to figure out what fiscal policy is gonna do, and they've had a hard time figuring out fiscal policy. And you cannot set effective monetary policy except as a reaction to fiscal policy. One mm -hmm. more statement I'll make. You go to the doctor for preventive medicine and for corrective medicine. The Fed can only practice corrective medicine. They can only try to mm -hmm. correct the problem out in the economy. It is hard for them to induce things into the economy. There's an old professor of economics that I used to have. He said two things. You can't throw the baby out with the bathwater, and you can't lead a horse to water and make him drink. The Fed has always been more effective as a break rather than as an accelerator. Mm -hmm. They can tone down the economy, but just increasing the money supply does not mean the people are going to do anything with it, and that apparently is the case right now with what the statistics are showing us. Businesses are hoarding that extra money. Mm -hmm. oh, <clears throat> now, when it comes to the question of, of reforming the Fed and whether the Fed would need to be reformed, I mean, one alternative would be you know, perhaps to change the people we have in charge at the Federal Reserve. If we're not happy with what's hap been happening, if, for instance, Bernanke let the housing bubble go on too long, we could always, you know, as is now being uh, occurring with uh, Bernanke stepping down, Janet Yellen taking over. I have a, some slides here to show f back from the 1970s. We had a very high inflation rate in the United States back in the 1970s when the Federal Reserve was uh, under the, the chairmanship of, of uh, Arthur Burns. Uh, on the left here, and then he was replaced in the, the late 1970s and in the 1980s, first by Paul Volcker and then Alan Greenspan, and we saw money supply growth come down and, and inflation uh, came back in, in line. So, when you, Dan, when you suggest that the Fed is in need of reform, 
what makes you think that simply uh, appointing a better chair Fed chairman uh, or chairperson is the case would be now uh, won't suffice? Well, there's a couple reasons for that. One of uh, the things that Milton Friedman uh, said in his book Capitalism and Freedom is that what you try to do with designing political economic institutions is to create an institution that's robust to deviations away from the perfect human being. Uh, and this goes back to Madison's uh, in Federalist 51. He talks about, well, if we had angels to run our government, we wouldn't have to take such care in crafting our, our governing institutions. Well, this, that's the problem with the Federal Reserve is we've crafted an institution that is, the, it can't suffer any deviations away from a perfectly omniscient and uh, perfectly benevolent uh, chairperson. And whenever you implement it in a world of real people, uh, and there's deviations away from that assumption of, of perfect information and perfect incentives, which is what happens in reality, uh, you, the, the institution doesn't work out as intended. Uh, Milton Friedman, James Buchanan, and F.A. Hayek, all three classical liberal scholars, uh, spent a lot of time studying the Federal Reserve, and at the beginning of their respective careers, each one said the Federal Reserve was necessary. We it doesn't work perfectly, but we can make some tweaks to make it work perfectly. Um, by the end of their careers, after studying it for a lifetime, each one of them ended up um, saying, throwing their hands up in the air and saying, hey, this, this institution can't be brought under control. It's so influenced by politics, by the legislative branch, by the, uh, by the executive branch, by special interest groups, by the economic profession itself, that we need drastic restructuring. Uh, F.A. Hayek turned to denationalizing currency. He said that you should allow banks to issue private currency. James Buchanan said we should put the monetary growth rule uh, into the Constitution. And Milton Friedman, uh, in his last interview, said, let's just put it over to a computer. We'll just put a mon monetary growth equation into the uh, computer and then not allow us to change it, because that, that way it couldn't be influenced by politics. Sort of a little reminiscent of the, the, the movie War Games, <laughs> perhaps. Um, Robert Earl, you mentioned how the, the Federal Reserve uh, Board of Governors has all of this power. Do you, uh, does, do you not find that troubling, or do you think that this power can be used generally beneficially? Now, that is a very good question. It's troubling only when you believe that the members that are being appointed do not operate independent and succumb to political pressure. Mm -hmm. There was a famous debate back in the late 40s that resulted in the famous Accord of 1951. Truman was president, and the debate strictly was, should the Treasury have authority over the Fed, or should the Fed remain an independent institution? Uh, president Truman obviously was on the side of saying that the Fed should remain an independent institution. One of his statements made in that debate was that if it was left up to the Treasury to have most of the power in running the Fed, political power would take over and the Fed would be run strictly in accordance to how many votes someone could get based on the political powers. Mm -hmm. That still remains the $64 question today, as my cohort here definitely knows, because he's working on a paper as the Fed Independent. I've often said you can't answer definitively that question, yes or no. Mm -hmm. It's going to be an ongoing debate. The Fed was intended to be independent, but it will be independent only if the Board of Governors do not succumb to political pressure, and that's the $64 question. Have they or have they not? Uh, President Obama said in his nominating speech for his first term that he did not know what the Fed uh, does. He, he doesn't understand the operation of the Fed, but apparently they've done a good job in providing housing to everyone. Well, that simply meant his comments on the Fed keeping interest rate low, which allowed people to buy houses easier. But we all know that the reason that housing exploded was the lowering of credit standards by the federal government's policies of the Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac. I'm not so sure that you can give Fed credit for expanding of housing as much as you can give the lowering of credit standards by certain policies of government agencies or government guaranteed agencies such as Freddie, Fannie and Jenny Mae. I happen to believe the Fed, again, was just responding to what fiscal policy was producing, and that's always been my position, that they can only respond. If you wrap all this stuff up into one final state, the Fed can only do one thing. All the fancy programs they announce, all of the, the, the discount ones they announce, all the bailing out of the financial crisis, they can only expand or contract the money supply in the long run. In the short run, they can do some things that will help the economy immediately, but in the long run, they have just one power, 
expand or contract the money supply. Dan, uh, uh, Robert mentioned some of the th th steps that we've taken to keep the, the Federal Reserve uh, independent. Now, I mean, the United States isn't the only uh, country with a central bank. I mean, when we compare across uh, nations, uh, how does the Federal Reserve rate in, in terms of its uh, independence from the political process, and why is that independence uh, in, uh, considered by economists to be a good thing? Yeah, across the world, uh, the Federal Reserve is one of the more independent central banks. Uh, performed very well uh, compared to uh, a lot of the nations around the world, especially a lot of developing nations that don't have the uh, developed democracies uh, to control uh, politicians abusing, explicitly abusing, uh, and influencing monetary policy. However, that's no reason that we shouldn't be well aware of the pitfalls and shortcomings of a centralized government controlled mon uh, monopoly of, of notes and currency. Um, this isn't a new problem. Adam Smith wrote about this in The Wealth of Nations where governments would turn to juggling tricks. They'd accumulate, to, they'd run deficits, accumulate debt, and then resort to inflation, debasing the currency in order to pay it off rather than actually coming out and saying, we're defaulting, we're just gonna print more currency. Um, we have to be well aware of that fact, and especially in the recent events of the last couple of years, we've seen huge deviations of policy by the Federal Reserve away from uh, what they're traditionally supposed to be doing, including inventing uh, corporations. They invented a, a corporation, an entity, uh, fair, uh, Made in Lanes LLC, then Made in Lanes 2 and Made in Lanes 3, to carry out and purchase uh, to, uh, toxic assets they could not officially by law do. They had to invent these mm -hmm. uh, new corporations in order to do that. Um, you've seen, uh, like I mentioned before the financial crisis, you had artificially low interest rates, including um, after adjusting for inflation, below zero interest rates. And then following the financial crisis, as we've seen, we've seen a, a huge drastic increase in the monetary base uh, to achieve and accommodate uh, the f fiscal policy going on. And it's, it, it to me, it, it shows a, a clear demonstration of, of a Federal Reserve that is not independent. And unfortunately, the, the appointment of Janet Yellen, I, I believe, is only going to carry on that trend and uh, make the Federal Reserve more susceptible to uh, influences from the current administration. I, I would agree with that. that okay. We're not going to see much change <laughs> in, in the operation of the Federal Reserve with a new appointee. If, if anything, we're going to see a more liberal approach to the operation of the Fed mm -hmm. with the new chairman rather than a more conservative approach because she's pretty well stated she will continue quantitative easing uh, that has been established that she will continue to use expanding of the money supply to keep interest rate down artificially so I, I don't really see much change in the way that I think the Fed's going to be operated under the new chairman. We uh, both of you have mentioned the some of the the pitfalls if uh, p politicians have too much uh, influence over uh, money supply or monetary policy. What ultimately ends up being the problem there? W what would politicians try to do if, if they had more control over the, the money supply and how does that end up being harmful for the economy? That's a good question because I don't know if they could do any more now than what's <laughs> already being done with the person of government securities and the amounts they're purchasing. And that's the big debate going on right now, is the Fed keeping interest rates down artificially to accommodate the economy, to allow borrowers to borrow at a lower rate, to induce more jobs and to induce unemployment, or as I happen to believe, are they accommodating fiscal policy by keeping interest rates down so the federal government's not having to pay as much interest on the national debt. Mm -hmm. If interest rates rose 1% out in the market, the interest on the national debt would double in what's being paid now, and it's already one of the third largest components in the federal budget. The federal government cannot afford, like they can't afford a lot of other things, for the amount of interest to go up. Mm -hmm. And so I think the Fed's policies now are accommodating fiscal policy by keeping interest rate down artificially because the federal government, until they get their act together, Congress gets their act together and does something about this deficit, we cannot afford to pay more interest than what's presently being paid. Real quick, something interesting happened back in the 90s when the Clintons claimed that they balanced the budget. The main reason the budget was balanced back during that time and people really investigated is that Clinton ordered the Treasury 
to pull in all long-term bonds and replace them with treasury uh, uh, bills, which were short-term notes. Obviously, the rate on T-bills is lower than rates on T-bonds, and the amount of interest that was being paid on the national debt immediately decreased, which mm -hmm. allowed him to say he had balanced the budget. But the result of that is we're at interest rate sensitive debt right now. Mm -hmm. Most of it is still short term, and if rates go up, it will expand the amount of interest being paid on that debt greatly. Well, Dan, you mentioned a couple of uh, possible reforms of the Milton Friedman's computer suggestion. Um, is there a particular reform that you would support or, or think would be the best course for us? Yeah, I do. Uh, I think the putting it into the Constitution, like James Buchanan mentioned, or turning it over to the computer, I think they'll both politicians would find some way to, in a time of economic disaster, uh, when you most needed an independent Fed to go in there and uh, change those rules. I think to really have an independent Federal Reserve or an independent monetary supply and handle a lot of these, uh, shelter our monetary supply from the influence of politics, you really need to denationalize it and allow competing currencies. You could have banks issue competing currencies out there against the U.S. dollar. And as the U.S. dollar, as the supply of U.S. dollars increase, people could say, oh, I'm expecting future infl inflation, I could switch over to another currency. And that would hold uh, the U.S. government in check and prevent that political influence, influence from manifesting itself in, uh, just in just increasing the monetary base. I think competing currencies have worked in a lot uh, in a lot of historical contexts it works in modern times in places like Singapore and I, I think exploring those types of options are the best way um, to move forward and drastically drastically restructure the Federal Reserve and prevent this type of political influence let me make a quick point we had a representative in the House of Representatives not too long ago said that if we kept building more runways and military bases and building more facilities on the island of Guam, it was going to tip over. <laughs> That's the truth, and he believed it. I think one of our problems in Congress today is the uninformed congressman of how the Fed works and what exactly the Fed is. I've seen many examples where they don't understand it, they don't know how it operates, yet they will criticize it even though they don't understand what they're criticizing. Somehow or another, Congress needs to be more informed about what the Fed is. And if, if they're more informed, I believe they would see that the Fed can do less about unemployment than what they think the Fed can do. Because mm -hmm. it seems that most all of them think that the Fed is the answer to unemployment. That's not the answer to unemployment. Physical policy is the answer to unemployment. Well, Thank you very much for the conversation tonight. This, I think it's been interesting and entertaining, and, and certainly I think uh, the, one of the problems, Robert, that you mentioned, the, the problem with the, the federal uh, debt and our interest rate sensitivity is certainly one that's not going away anytime soon, and so I think uh, these issues are going to remain important for us uh, in the, the weeks and years and months going ahead. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, we'll be back next week with another uh, e-conversation.